lungs causes breathlessness and after that in some cases we don't know who there have been all kind of correlative studies but if you look at the data it's still not clear actually who gets more affected who gets less affected we know there are certain factors which uh, make you more predisposed to the worst effect of this virus like comorbidities other diseases uh, old age uh, but it's not always like that second thing that has happened over a period of time as we are learning more and more about this virus and that is where nbrc comes in and that's where dr pankaj jet comes in fairly early on there were anecdotal reports that some people who have had this virus come back with some neurological symptoms i remember one of the earliest report was from a single patient in japan uh had strong neurological symptoms and only thing their doctors could say was perhaps it's because of the covid virus and as the time went on it turned out that virus affects not only lungs it can affect brain it can affect other organs of the body it can do a damage that actually lasts for a very long time to multiple organs of the body if you had a very severe form of it and i'm glad that uh, pankaj who himself is involved in some of the work at nbrc we have few scientists who are looking at how uh, this virus affects the brain and he himself is interested in this and is looking at it using stem cell cultures so uh, as we go along we learn more about it and on behalf of nbrc i welcome all of you to what is going to be a very very informative webinar on how covid 19 virus which we call sars cov 2 virus affects the brain uh, i will not take more time i'll just uh, say once again that one of the scientists who is working on covid pankaj said at nbrc are organizing this webinar and uh, i will ask pankaj to now introduce today's speaker uh dr padma yeah sure okay sure, yes yeah, sir thank you thank you so much are uh, you all can hear me hello yes sir yes sir we can hear you okay okay so uh, as part of the nbrc's outreach activity today we present to you a webinar on a very important and timely topic as uh, professor jain uh, suggested on the topic called covid and the brain and the need for this was as uh, was pointed out earlier is the recent studies which are you know uh, are very clearly indicating that there is a huge component of uh, neurological symptoms in these covid survivors up to 40% of covid 19 survivors present with neurocognitive problems or deficits of uh, the various symptoms which dr uh, padma will uh, you know touch upon now there's also uh, due to uh, continued information overload overload nowadays through print and popular media as well as uh, through by googling uh, there's lot of information which is actually not accurate at times and it's very frightening so hence that we at nbrc always try to provide uh, the accurate information for the general public as that effort we have now requested one of the more uh, very highly accomplished and a senior neurologist from Orange Institute of Medical Sciences uh, professor padma shirvasto to give this lecture uh, for uh, you know such as you know to remove the myths and give you the facts now about professor padma shirvasto she is one of the uh, an authority in stroke research ma'am is one of the first neurologists in india who completed a comprehensive clinical trials used for you know proving whether the stem cells could be helpful or not way back in last almost a decade ago uh, dr padma chivasta completed her masters in neurology from orange institute of medical sciences where she is currently professor and head at the uh, at the neurology department she is chief of the neuroscience center at aims a padma shri awardee in 2016 for her contributions into medical science so we have a very highly accomplished uh, neurologist who will be talking to us and we are very fortunate ma'am and we thank you that you have agreed to uh, spare your time 
and help us uh, reach out to general audience for the uh, for today's important lecture. Uh, Ma'am also serves on various committees at ICMR, DBT, and DST. And uh, Dr. Padma Shivast is fellow of uh, Indian Academy of Neurology, National Academy of Medical Sciences, National Academy of Sciences, and she her list of awards goes uh, very long. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, last but not the least, she's also an honorary professor at the University of Central Lancashire at UK. With that introduction, ma'am, I'd now request you to please start your presentation. And I request all the participants to keep your mics at mute and so that you know, we can uh, take your questions at the end of the talk. Please feel free to chat your, uh, put your questions in the chat box and I, I will you know, combine some common questions and ask those questions and get, try to get your answers from Dr. Padma Shivasa. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pankaj, and uh, thank you, Professor uh, Neeraj. You know, this is this is a really unique uh, experience. I mean, I I'm feeling honored to be amidst uh, the icons. You know, I didn't I didn't uh, really realize that I'll be in the midst of father figures and real achievers in science and truly and an honor to be uh, you know amidst all of you and thank you uh, pankaj for giving me this opportunity so you know our close encounters with this new bug as professor need had said is a nightmare and we are passing through one there seems to be no end to it and he has also pointed out that each day is a learning experience so it's just around 10 months that we have known this disease and what we have learned is turning out to be uh, illusion. So it's a constant metamorphosis of illusion seeming realities, reality seeming illusions. So again, I would reiterate that it's a really a learning curve that we still seem to be on, whether in terms of understanding this disease, finding the armamentarium to manage, prevent, and you know, deal with this multitude of issues beyond medical that this bug has actually, uh, you know, thrown at us. Now, what we know, I'm quickly a recap is that this emerged as a, you know, a respiratory virus causing a respiratory illness, but turned into a pandemic again as a respiratory pathology. That was in March. And then this, you know, a uh, uh, pretty looking virus uh, in terms of having a crown was very similar to the other coronaviruses. And there was, of course, literature on the other viruses and there were similarities and people quickly got down to try to find the similarities and dissimilarities and the infectivity potential about this virus. And in the original and just imagine this is a publication in july 2020 and july 2020 seems like a decade earlier because so much has changed in terms of even the case fatality and the prevalence of underlying cardiovascular diseases so earlier it was thought that this covid 19 is not really so bad and in fact you had seen people proclaiming even on the, the media saying that look it's like a flu and even flu kill a lot of people except that this is seems to be far more infectious and then again this quickly changed and the mode of transmission was delineated earlier and there was this alpha and beta coronaviruses only infecting humans the others don't and then the kind of transmission and let's not getting in get into those you know controversial issues that who caused what and where and and why the entry into human cells again i'm not getting into the basic science you are you know you know much more experienced and savvy about it than me i'm just a clinician but what would, I would be interested is that the spikes protein, envelope protein, membrane protein, nuclear capsid, and these issues, which have emerged as targets for both for the management as well as preventive processes. And then spikes protein is one thing, which sort of figures so prominently in the multitude of the, you know, the, the quest for getting the adequate optimum vaccine and as quickly as possible so just like you know time is brain time seems to be the quintessential element in trying to combat this 
and, and and that's how probably some amount of compromises were also made in science per se in terms of trying to quickly get kind of so you know some kind of solution to the innumerable problems and almost in insurmountable problems that this pandemic is throwing at us now this slide is purposefully blank because every single day the numbers are changed right so one day we feel that the graph is going down the next day it seems to be an illusion and again we are going up and then we're going down so the global distribution of covid 19 and we have this dubious distinction of sort of overtaking every other country we are number two uh well that's where we are now the clinical manifestations of this pandemic as we are all aware now even as a school going child knows across the different social economic geographic barriers across the universe knows that this was the you know the the cluster of clinical manifestations you had fever chills cough dyspnea fatigue and a bunch of you know biochemical markers predominantly lymphopenia and low platelets now this obviously was also initially rated to be something like 90 percent must have fever all right a large majority must have cough and the moment there is a difficulty in breathing that is a red flag and you know the antenna goes up and then they will quickly need uh you know either in quickly they get admitted and and more intensive monitoring now this was a picture at one point of time which has still holds true but the diagnosis of covid pandemic again you know that the different stages we've been through we still have a the gold standard being the rt pcr and you will have this nasal swabs being poked into the nose and to the throat now that still is a gold standard but we've realized in the tertiary care centers and in all the emergency care settings that time is a quintessential issue whenever there is an emergency whether it is a road traffic accident a heart attack or a brain attack time is an essence you can't wait for 8 to 12 hours I and mean, in sometimes 24 hours to know the covid status of a patient and knowing the covid status of a patient had become paramount importance for reasons more than one and we'll come to that a little later shortly so the diagnostic you know the the methods then changed and we now routinely use also use a true nat cv nat which gives you the you know the the earliest it can give you is a couple of hours which is also pretty good and then a lot of antigen kits came in wherein they said 15 minutes flat and recently have heard that the us has now developed a point of care system bless them if they had i hope it does work out because several of these antigens really didn't we do have an antigen analysis which is applied even in in institute but that has a large percentage of being false negative so that's a red flag so it's positive gives me the assurance negative it does not so that's where you know it, it falls in but the bulk testing and when you quickly need to try it a system these antigen testing which is available in 15 minutes flat result will also be of help so there are in fact innumerable number of groups who are still trying to get a point of care system which can give you the result in just like you have a point of care system for prothrombin time or for malaria or you know or glucose what have you so seriously looking beyond fever and cough and the neurological aspects of covid ladies and gentlemen what we have learned now is beyond the respiratory system that the one system which really emerged in COVID pandemic is nervous system. The first system which was recognized as being involved significantly has been the nervous system. And beyond that, we also now know we have cardiovascular, we have kidneys, we have gastrointestinal system, the skeletal muscular system and what have you. But the, the first system which went, you know, which got involved or got the recognition that, look, this is happening beyond the respiratory system has been actually the nervous system. And the overview, you know, starts off in December, the Wuhan literature, and what did they say? Now, they quickly published their experience, and in their group of patients who were admitted with severe respiratory illness, you see, there are two terms, which I'm sure you're well aware of. There's something, there's a, there's a thing called ILI, that is influenza-like illness, 
that's like a flu the other is sorry that is severe acute respiratory illness so anybody who was coming with severe acute respiratory illness would being admitted during admission they have seen that some group of patients exhibited neurological manifestation so then they initially reported that it is a severely affected patients who are more likely to develop neurological symptoms and now you know that this is not true this is not true so you would have a mild moderate disease we in fact we have diseases that come with a neurological problem and have no evidence of flu in terms of clinical manifestations at all so the entire spectrum is now known and the neuro infection may also contribute to the respiratory problem and I'm, i'm not even talking of pathophysiology of covid-19 here because that spectrum is now really much much wider so originally what people thought was that because of the complaints of you know loss of smell loss of taste anosmia gusha which you're well aware of and i'll come to that a little uh, later that this virus has gained an entry to the through the nose passes through the cribriform plate gets into the brain through the olfactory system and therefore there is a neurotropism which has been demonstrated as well as a peripheral to the central nervous system entry point and the other way is that through the blood stream especially in severity in patients and through the blood stream there's a hematogenous spread which can go into the nervous system but what was more important is that the this invasive potential you know the the neurotropism the invasive potential of the the virus into the nerves nervous system into the brain may actually have a role in contributing to the severity of respiratory failure so it is not just the lungs it is not just the endothelial system it is just not the thromboembolic phenomena but also the central drive so maybe this itself has a you know a role to play as to why these patients quickly go into severe hypoxemia and you know have a, a sort of a spiraling effect where within few few hours you known that in the initial uh, few months of pandemic you had actually people just dying even before you could have the time to react and and uh, you know address those issues so the mechanisms as i said before originally they thought it was directly through the peripheral nervous system into it or to the hematogenous system but then we've also got several other explanations and i'll come to that hypothesis a little later so what is the clinical evidence that the nervous system is involved so the as professor neeraj has said there were initially some reports which emerged here and there and you know from the ent departments from the other departments and you know from the medicine departments and people who were admitted into acute icus that yes there could be some meningitis encephalitis they were disposed you know infection in the neuropathies and acute flaccid paralysis classically the guillain barre syndrome what we call as gbs and and quickly then anosmia hyposmia dysgeusia that is loss or you know decreased smell and taste they got added on to the flu screen see originally the flu screen only had this if you all remember when we had the lockdown in march what was the flu screen in april the flu screen was travel history the other one was you know coming from red zones containment zones contact history and number 3 was someone who has fever cough chills you have maybe myalgias and with or without you know, difficulty in breathing now they were the, that was a flu screen so anybody in a pandemic coming with fever or sore throat or chills or myalgias or then came this these three that is loss of smell and loss of taste so this they added on to the list of so called flu screen and subsequently we've also added diarrhea so the other complaints were added on to a flu screen with or without the presence of fever cough chills or myalgias so this was recognized then so the paper which got published in april in jama neurology said that in the admitted patients about 200 who were severely ill who were in the icu nearly 40% percent 
had exhibited some kind of a neurological manifestations. And what were they? They were in terms of central nervous system predominantly, some peripheral nervous system, dizziness, headache, you know, imbalance, ataxia, encephalopathy, that is impaired consciousness was all pervading. Now that was one feature which was increasingly recognized. So people were on ventilators and then they, the ventilator assistance decreased. They were, they were brought out of ventilator, sedation was taken out, but still the patient looked sedated. They were not waking up. So that was encephalopathy. And they tried to look into why is the patient not waking up in spite of his lungs getting better, off ventilator, off sedation. And therein, you know, there's several other features then emerge. Or they could have sudden neurological deficits like a stroke or a brain attack. The peripheral nervous system, the mild ones, you know, the mild and moderate, you know, degree of infection usually presented with a gusia nausea. And now we have enough literature to say that the presence of loss of taste and loss of smell, in fact, were usually seen in people who had a milder disease they improved very well very rarely they went on to have a very severe disease and the recovery of anosmia has also been seen though it may take much longer so but these were sort of harbingers or biomarkers to say that they reflect a milder pathology as compared to people who having severe COVID-19 illness and of course, neuropathies and GBS were more of post-COVID or what we call as a COVID tail syndrome. That's a new terminology which has been coined and I'll come to that a little later. And of course, myalgias, fatigue, aches and pains, which indicate that there is uh, involvement of the muscles. And in these patients, when you do a CPK or a blood test, it is elevated. And why does it happen? We'll come to it. And this is a representative slide of one of the patients, again, from Wuhan, who actually developed a stroke, who actually came in with a stroke. So the CT scan showed this hypodensities suggestive of ischemic strokes. And now in our protocol, all patients with a stroke get a plain CT scan. Concomitantly, they also get a plain CT chest. And the patient did not have any fever or cough, but the CT chest revealed the typical ground glass peripheral capacities all right so this is a covid lung there are several grades to it but this would indicate that this patient may actually have a corona infection so these are some of those red flags which indicate that you must test for covid in fact let me you know tell you in low resource settings especially when the testing has not been very rampant and even in our country where when we in the those times when they were not rammed up to such a situation where we were like Currently, we're doing lots of testing every day, but there was a, you know, that, that time when we couldn't do that. In those situations, it was CT chest was picking up these COVID lungs, which gave you a red flag. And even when they were not tested for, with an RT-PCR, they were being managed as COVID. And those kind of permutations, combinations are still being done in resource poor settings. Now, there are a bunch of biomarkers, which also sort of, you know, tell you that maybe this COVID patient may develop neurological features where a uh, low lymphocyte count, in fact, a ratio of a total count to a lymphocyte count. So if your TLC is high and the lymphocytes are lower, so the ratio, the, you know, the higher the ratio, the more chance, also low platelets and a high blood urea nitrogen. Now, this bunch of biomarkers were initially thought to be specific for development of neurological manifestations. And now it's known in the last four to six weeks that they've also seen an acute kidney injury. See, that's the reason I was telling you that we're still on a learning curve. So these biochemical markers initially indicated that there's going to be a nervous system involvement. Now we know that it basically indicates that the system involvement would be there, whether it is nervous, whether it is, you know, gastrointestinal, whether it is kidney. So the, the COVID-19 has gone on to be an endothelial disease and a systemic infection. There was another report which got published from Lancet this time of 221 patients who were again admitted. And in them, Five, about 6% developed sudden strokes or the sudden brain attacks, which are basically strokes. And they looked into the variety of strokes. Predominantly, they found them to be because of ischemia or 
a clot in the artery as against less number of bleeds in the brain or hemorrhagic strokes. And so here, out of uh, probably 17 strokes, predominantly there were, you know, uh, the, the ones predominantly were those patients with some kind of uh, cardiovascular disease or without a cardiovascular disease. And we'll come to that a little later. And another patient, another report of 52 critically ill patients, here also the critically, the critical illness were predominantly seen in patients who were slightly older. Now you know that this is no rocket science, it's a no-brainer. All of us now know that there's enough literature to say that there are vulnerable group of patients who are obviously a little older and who have comorbid situations like underlying diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, malignancy, or previous strokes. So our immunocompromised. So this is a vulnerable group. And now it is well validated that it is a vulnerable group wherein who would require extra precautions and extra preventive actions. And that's the reason we have this, you know, the Jan Andolan movement also, which has been promulgated and launched because it is the, the, the more privileged and, uh, you know, less vulnerable group who get COVID and actually end up being super spreaders. And it is the more vulnerable group who catch from them and and the mortality let me tell you ladies and gentlemen uh, you need to be really really you have to take this seriously because in the vulnerable group in an aged patient the mortality can be as high as 66 percent that's not funny and even in the group with between 18 to do you know 55 years age group even there the mortality is now known to be 17.6 percent that's also not funny. So therefore, we are not dealing with an illness which is predictable, and that's what makes it pretty scary. So the clinical characteristics of these 138 hospitalized patients, again, got published in JAMA. we are seen that predominantly anyone who's developed neurological problems, especially strokes, were the ones who required a prolonged ICU care. And they didn't do well. So the strokes with COVID versus strokes without COVID, strokes with COVID with all other measures being equal, the severity of stroke, the comorbid illness, et cetera, the one with COVID didn't do well. So they were far more likely to be detrimental. And for the outcomes, there again, for reasons more than one. Similarly, you know, the first report where 40% had developed these uh, you know, neurological manifestations did have a large number had a comorbid illness predominantly central nervous system some peripheral nervous system and encephalopathy 15 percent encephalopathy was a commonest manifestations right and uh, uh, this went on to you know there was a there was another report which then came in and this is what was really really troubling to us and this is what we also encountered in Ames in april this year is that a large number of patients who develop these acute neurological manifestations did develop very early onset into the illness. Say somebody is diagnosed with COVID, they're admitted. It is in the first one week, they also develop a neurological problem. And the worst is those patients who had no, nothing to suggest a flu, came in as a stroke, then went on to develop problems or clinical manifestations of found on lung x-rays or incidental CT chest, findings suggestive of COVID then got tested and turned out to be positive. So this group is the one which sort of became spreaders because when they're coming with nothing suggestive of COVID, you're managing them as a non-COVID emergency. So you're not taking the personal protection equipment like you do when you're dealing with a COVID positive patient. So thereby, you're exposed, the caregiver and the family gets exposed, the triage area and the corridors of transport get exposed, the imaging facilities like CT, MRI get exposed, the lift system, and as well as the ICUs. Now, the entire system gets exposed because you don't know the COVID positive status in such individuals. So that became a problem, and hence, these patients became, you know, then we learned, then the, the protected code stroke mechanism started coming and uh, we've developed other 
you know, kind of markers to identify these. So what are those lab findings and what are those, you know, bunch of markers which actually help you to diagnose, uh, you know, uh, or I should say that point towards the presence of a neurological problem. As I said before, you have a high TLC and a low lymphocyte count, increased CRP, and also the other markers which tended towards the presence of consumptive coagulopathy. Okay, so the consumptive coagulopathy can be diagnosed by high D-dimer levels. All right, so you have a high D-dimer, high ferritin levels, which means that we are getting into a system where there's consumptive coagulopathy. There could be thromboembolic phenomena which may be involving not just the brain, even the respiratory and other systems as well. The, the derangement of LFT, RFT yeah. would indicate as a multi-organ yeah. and even... So this is the yeah. lab thing. And, and this is a summary of the neurological manifestations, which was hypothesized then in March. And later slides would tell you the actual, you know, the, the cartoons which show you this, that headache, malaise, fatigue, imbalance, with or without the real flu features, anosmia, agusia, cerebral bleeds, cerebral infarctions, acute neuropathy, encephalitis, meningitis, ADEM, and brainstem encephalitis, and autoimmune phenomena like seizure and post-COVID neuropathies in GPS. The hypothesized Dr. Reasons Padma, with, could you could yes? you Dr. Padma, could you break out this some of these uh, words into common latum words, you know, uh, something like um, hemorrhage and that level. So because we have a mixed audience, this lecture is very, okay. very useful for all of us. Yeah. But some so, maybe I'll try, of... I'll try, I'll try, I'll try. Thank you, thank you. Oh, okay. So I, I mean, the hypothesized reasons were that there are these receptors called angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors. And you must have heard of the, you know, the initial controversy about should I take ACE2 inhibitors for my hypertension? Should I change it? So these receptors were actually seen to be present in the entire body, whether it is in the brain, in the nerves, in the muscles, in the gastrointestinal system, in the heart. So they, wherever these receptors were present, that's where COVID-19 could get entry point into the body. So therefore, it was not just lungs. Wherever these receptors were there, you had an entry point for COVID-19. So therefore, it explains why the nervous system got involved. Secondly, what would, you, what would be the proof to say that, yes, this virus has gone to the brain? That would be when you actually open the brain and look for the viral or what we call as viral signatures. Now we have some evidence, a very limited autopsy, you know, uh, results that we know of but however it's now been proven that these viral signatures that means particles of this virus were actually found in people who died of COVID-19 pandemic in their brains so we now know that it enters the brain and the second is you know of CSF the cerebrospinal fluid or in doing a lumbar puncture taking the fluid out and looking for viral signatures in this fluid people could demonstrate that so now we have the proof that this virus enters the nervous system. And we've already talked about how through the nose it can enter the brain. That is a retrograde method of peripheral to central spread of the virus. And we've also seen that low lymphocyte count means that the body immunity is low. Whenever there is an immune suppression, then it is seen that any infection, whenever the immunity is low, you get predisposed to infection and the infection turns out to be severe. That may be happening. And it is also said about consumptive coagulopathy. Now, what is exactly meant by consumptive coagulopathy? The blood thickens. It has a greater tendency to form into clots. And that can be because the mechanisms which actually maintain the fluidity of the blood are they're going to disarray. And that is borne out by certain tests, which are, we call as biomarkers, like D-dimer or ferritin or low platelets, you know, things like that, wherein there is both a tendency for bleeding, tendency for clotting. This is called consumptive coagulopathy. So that may be one of the reasons why there are heart attacks because the heart vessels are getting blocked or brain attacks because the brain vessels are getting clogged. And because these receptors are also seen in muscles, 
Therefore, you get this muscle aches and pains. What we call as myalgias, and that can be borne out for the fact that there is a blood biomarker called CPK, which increases whenever there is a muscle injury or muscle involvement. Infection, you see, the infection produces, you know, most of you have heard of what is called as a cytokine storm. In fact, I, you know, we get keep getting these questions even from complete lay public uh, on portals like uh, Delhi uh, on, on Doodashan. You know, they're saying that we've heard about what is this uh, cytokine storm and interleukins and we're giving this tocilizumab as one of the armamentarium that we have to manage a severe infection. So the cytokines are body defense mechanisms. It's like the war, the virus is invading us, there is a war, and we have our own body systems of fighting against the virus. And that system includes cytokines. But unfortunately, you know, whenever we, there, there is a confined space and there is a, somebody who is firing at you, so you fire back. So when you're firing and supposing you put a bomb there, the bomb is a great big armamentarium, but when the bomb explodes, you're also there, you'll also be affected. So that was happening to the body because these cytokines were actually acting our own systems as well. They're big defense, but they could be offensive to your own system. Plus, as I said before, encephalopathy, that means becoming altered or staying sedated, not waking up, remaining in coma could also be because of multiple other things. You heard of hypoxia. You heard of happy hypoxia, wherein the oxygen saturation falls, you don't even know. Suddenly the saturation is so low that a very rapid coma sets in because of acidosis, because of organ dysfunction and sepsis is where there's infection which has gone into the bloodstream. And also because of multitude of medications, you heard of this thing wherein people are you know, prone. They say, you know, you nurse the patient in a prone state in an ICU when there is a severe COVID infection because in a prone state, the requirement of oxygen will be lesser and there will be more oxygen going to the lungs and the brain. But in a prone state, you know, you can't lie down prone for long. So patient needs to be sedated. And when the patient is sedated, the patient doesn't wake up and you assume it to be an encephalopathy. So there are a lot of situations wherein it can contribute to the patient being sedated and said to be in coma and in originally when they looked at all the brain attacks and they documented and they found that except one person who was a little younger mostly they were all older individuals and they were mostly as i said before the artery had got clotted and not the artery breaking up and causing bleeding but then the heart involvement became known and it was seen that the heart muscle can be involved in terms of direct infection of the muscle called as myocarditis. It could be injured. It also could be because of the fact that the rhythm, the heart rate variability, the heart rate could become suddenly irregular, can suddenly go down and suddenly stop. In fact, sudden cardiac deaths have been noted and also the atherosclerosis or you know the bad fatty things which get deposited in the arteries they could get destabilized and they could actually break off into little, little clots, go up the bloodstream and clot smaller blood vessels. And that could happen in the heart. It could happen in the brain. Heart and brain are intricately related because heart is pumping. It's a basically a pump. It pumps up the blood. It doesn't do its job. Then no blood goes anywhere and the blood doesn't go to brain. It lands up with a brain attack. So cardiovascular disease itself could be causing strokes and We've also seen that the elderly who have diabetes, who smoke, who have hypertension, they are the ones who are more prone to have a severe you know, COVID-19 infection. They were also likely to develop strokes. So that was another reason why they were happening. And inflammation. If you see, inflammation is basically, again, a body's reaction to an insult. So for example, if there is an injury, there is edema, right? There is pain and the, the whole system there the inflammatory mark, the, the cells come in there to cordon off that insult, whether it is an infection or an injury. The inflammatory response itself can be a reason why strokes or 
heart attacks happen and this is well known this plaque destabilization and rupture has been seen with inflammation because of infection and even simple thing like air pollution and now we have a lot of emphasis on you know coming festive seasons and crackers hopefully we will not see this time and air pollution is a big thing because that with climate change may actually up the risk of having this more severe infection than when the air is pure and when there is no inflammation similarly the interleukins you see this bunch of biomarkers and i'm sure you heard of this term called interleukins so on the il6 and il6 is being measured in most of the severely ill icu patients now and when they monitor il6 and they find that il6 levels are going up they quickly bring in this medication called tocilizumab and now we have the indian make from the you know biotech down south and they they are bringing up this low cost uh, medications which can counter this levels of il6 so this is important now and it is been ingrained into most of the protocols in an icu setting to fight covid pandemic okay and the prothrombotic state as i said before d dimers ferritins there's something called apla you know the apla syndromes is a secondary and and there are some implications in managing stroke and i'll just put in one paragraph on that and the last thing is the viruses you know the viruses per se can affect the blood vessels and this is well documented in childhood strokes you know children also can have strokes or brain attacks and this usually happens in certain infections called you know it may happen in varicella infection you know chicken pox infection in that the arteries get affected so the arteries get affected and they clog and this is a well documented thing in children who present with stroke so they thought that maybe this virus this covid is also implicating directly a blood vessel and thereby it is causing strokes we don't know but arteriopathy was one so this is a <coughs> uh basic clearly a table it sort of summarizes and this is a good take home message for the the if there are any young uh, you know listeners out there this would actually summarize the whole neurological spectrum in covid 19 so you can have an encephalopathy encephalitis you can have meningitis you can have stroke you have this minor features like anosmia aguish as the loss of smell loss of taste or acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis gilbert barre syndrome which is acute paralysis of the whole body muscle injury presentation like coma or you have just headache and neck pain or you can have a sudden paralysis loss of taste loss of smell or flaccid muscle weakness or paralysis or severe aches and pains the diagnostic tests which are required are listed here and the pathogenesis so this thing sort of summarizes and there's another one here in which which gives you even more information that covid 19 can affect the nervous system because it's involving the whole body because it is a systemic disease it is causing you know what is called as low oxygen and metabolic features it is causing clotting across the body and even in the lungs even in the kidneys and it is causing this inflammation thereby you know you heard of this kawasaki like syndrome which is described in children so this is all because of the system involvement or directly invading the brain directly invading the peripheral nervous systems of muscles and thereby causing problems and most important is this covid tail now it's called a covid tail because covid is gone but beyond covid after this infection you develop this gillian barre syndrome or acute neuropathy or acute paralysis and what is more scary is this degenerative diseases and this is where you have now a global initiative consortia which are looking into what are called as a development of cognition memory behavior mental health issues and degenerative diseases like alzheimer's dementia and parkinson's disease why because the involvement of the brain especially through the nose and through the olfaction and causing loss of smell and ladies and gentlemen it is known that loss of smell may be a harbinger of development of degenerations like parkinson's disease and dementia like alzheimer's and so now we have in fact literature which has documented on an mri certain areas of involvement 
and doing functional imaging in terms of say a bold MRI or even diffusion tensor imaging, looking at the tractography, looking at the involvement of parenchyma in terms of the glucose uptake or in terms of you know the blood perfusion scans, certain areas are being mapped out wherein there may be viral persistence or signatures of a sequelae or damage which may be actually cascading some events ultimately leading to the set of degenerative diseases and so this is what is hypothesized and is being looked for but of course mental health issues is not only because of a viral infect viral invasion you know there are multitude of problems today just today morning we have you know turns out that today is the you know the the world palliative medicine day you know the and and palliative care is such an integral part of uh, you know managing entire disease spectrum you know irrespective of the age of the person and and then we had talked about in the triage in people who are desperately ill in people who have recovered because the issues are not just an infection the issues are stigmatization issues are of the concerns of infection to self to the caregivers to the family to the society how society is looking at the whole system they are isolated so being in isolation facing the stigma and in the mild and moderate even in covid survivors the problems of lockdown problems of societal economic geographic cultural you know there's so many issues which are ingrained into this pandemic all of them have great implications in mental health so these are the things which are unique probably to this pandemic as, as against others so the last part of my talk is managing a non covid emergencies you see covid pandemic when it actually you know came in and when we had a lockdown and then we started opening up what was happening it was just covid and covid and covid every institute being modified into covid center including hotels including stadia including wherever so the triaging was just covid it was just sari and ili so what was happening to heart attacks brain attacks cancers where would they go so the initial lockdown meant that there was no transport people were confused people were scared people were even you know wondered where to go how to go whom to approach and even if they did go would they be entertained and this simply a fear of getting infected getting into a clinical care system because there was always a mixture of covid people coming in there said that initially what had happened was there were less a number of strokes documented less a number of heart attacks documented and obviously the road traffic accidents disappeared when the during lockdown lockdown opened we are back to square one we have enough trauma now so the trauma also comes in cancer comes in heart attacks come in brain attacks come in what do you do they are all time sensitive there is a golden hour for all these patients covid or non covid a blocked artery has to be unblocked that stays so therefore we developed protected code mechanisms like a protected code stroke and region specific algorithms like say for example there is a patient coming to aims emergency now in an aims emergency you get a influenza like illness you have a respiratory illness you also have a person coming with a brain attack and a heart attack and now we know that these brain attacks or strokes may come in without any flu symptoms they just come in as a stroke so the stroke may be without covid stroke may be with covid or suspected covid so what do you do there so we develop protocols algorithms so that no patient goes untreated and we try and maintain that a dodge time is brain you need a timely intervention and of course telemedicine tele stroke has come up in a huge way you know the mci also changed the guidelines gave it a far more you know a, a legal perspective where it becomes safer for a clinician to interact and prescribe and it is also now got into the ministry and icmr is also coming up with guidelines of telemedicine how to actually not just triage hand hold prevent rehabilitation and entire care pathway these 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 guidelines have come up and now routinely names we do tele triage to people who are outside institute and who need who need more, you know help we do tele medicine in terms of the prevention 
we have two verticals our outpatients are both daily as well as in person which is required because people coming from different states they still can't reach us so telephonically we are able to connect and a lot of problems can be managed so the essentially the triage means you need protection to yourself you need to protect the patient the caregiver and protect the healthcare system so originally when we didn't have these protocols in place there was a mixture suddenly a patient who said to be a stroke we thought it was non covid because there was nothing to suggest covid turns out to be covid after a couple of days by then the person has gone through corridors to the lift to the system is in the icu with all other patients who were non covid and exposing the healthcare workers in the process the ct machine in the process so therefore we developed a green corridor and in the triage we made sure that any emergency is treated as a covid unless until proved otherwise so you have a personal protection gear in place protect the patient put a mask on all the aerosol generating procedure what is meant by aerosol that is aerosol is when there are droplets coming out from the patient like you know when there would be severe wheezing or you're trying to intubate he would cough so aerosol producing procedures are minimized they're protected and there is a very high index of intervention in the sense that don't try to intubate extubate intubate extubate don't do that try and reduce aerosol procedures and we have an infection control screen we still have a tick mark we look at all this travel history is no longer relevant now forget it containment zones no longer relevant now because we we evolved over this all this but they were in place earlier and as i said before that protection systems in place limited people in the emergency and limited exposure so that therefore we are, we are rostering we are rostering the residents the faculty who deal with it so it's six hours into pp another roster come in therefore the, there is a minimization of healthcare workers exposure so that in that time they going to take care of the patients very very well and we have designated area so if a person is a known covid they go to designate covid area and in our designate covid area is our trauma center that is complete six floors which are you know different strata according to severity they are they go there and then the whole system is in level 3 you no know, personal protection the covid suspect you are awaiting the result because you know rt pcr takes about 12 hours so these people go to holding area so we have designated holding areas in my neurology I have one floor only for that one corridor one ct machine and one lift only for a covid suspect so that i don't keep on sanitizing and whenever you sanitize that many hours are lost wherein you know you may have to have a patients who are piling up and remember time is brain and the non covid is a routine corridor so we made these algorithms this is a protected core stroke which i've already explained to you and the types of strokes were coming as i said before non covid no problem you know the algorithm suspected covid again we developed it and undiagnosed covid are the ones which we have clubbed into suspected covid so only when they are totally negative five days in the covid area in the suspect area and they are negative then we transport them to a complete non covid area because otherwise there's a mixture of patients and there would be lot of cross spread and they become super spreaders and in an acute stroke say classic example of an artery being blocked whether it is confirmed suspected or an asymptomatic in the sense the infection may be a incidental because the infection is now a pandemic a lot of people are asymptomatic and you heard of this they are asymptomatic they don't exhibit anything and they may actually have a stroke which is because of another reason not because of covid and when you test it is covid too because they are asymptomatic carriers or it is suspected you know the covid is actually causing it and of course confirmed where it is there any of these the management is the same have your protection in place and unblock and how do you unblock the artery giving the intravenous clot lysing drug so we routinely doing this in aims our intravenous thrombolysis rate is routine about 2 to 3 per week originally we used to do one every day now it's not that much and the mechanical which is in the form of an angiogram so any intervention in terms of angiography like you know you have the dsa 
where you put in a catheter, look into the arteries, any intervention we do, CBNAT, TrueNAT, two hours after the result, you know, in two hours we get a result, the result is negative, then we take to DSA in neurosciences. If it is positive, they go to the trauma center, COVID designate, and they get managed there. Similarly, for all the surgical procedures in stroke. So the algorithm rhythms remains the same, except protection processes, definitive corridors have been designated so that there is no, you know, cross spread across the different health systems. So that's a protected cold stroke. And there are different, you know, the, these things are picturesque. They're visually impactful. We, we actually display them in the triage area so that everybody is aware. You heard of, uh, you know, something called multiple sclerosis as well, autoimmune diseases. That's another thing which has come up in a big way. We brought out guidelines for India for management of stroke, which is a statement, you know, for in COVID pandemic. This we published in May 2020 in Annals of Indian Academy of Neurology. We also brought out how to manage young patients coming with multiple sclerosis and other demyelinating diseases these are the other ones which come up suddenly and they strike young people and in here immune suppression is a very important criteria so we brought out that and then this is all our experience in the last six months of dealing with covid pandemic and neurological problems especially stroke now, ladies and gentlemen interestingly the first two strokes we documented who were COVID positive were both bleeds in the brain. The blood vessel broke and they had bleeding. One patient was a 65 year old who was not a hypertensive, no flu screen, denied any containment zone, came up with sudden onset of hemiplegia, that is one side not working in the morning. The son brought him. There's nothing to suggest COVID pandemic there. Nothing to suggest a COVID infection there. And the CT scan showed a bleeding. So we took him to the ward. Then two days later, he developed fever cough. And then when we did the, uh, the you know, rt it was positive. So then he was shifted to the trauma center. The second patient was a 55-year-old man. He was a hypertensive, but well-controlled blood pressure. And he also came in, again, no flu screen, no contact. He was an educated person, no travel. And this was in the month of April. And he also turned out to be COVID positive. So these were the, in fact, these two cases we reported in May 2020. These were the first stroke cases reported from India in COVID pandemic. We also wrote up about our hypothesis on whether stroke was incidental, triggered, or causative. And in the annals of New, New York Academy of Sciences, we brought out this paper on the what's happened to brain attacks, and this probably could be extrapolated even to heart attacks. During the pandemic and the challenges, if, if we had an epoch, say, uh, the same year, same time last year, how many strokes were there? Same time this year, the strokes sort of decreased by almost two thirds. Mm -hmm. And then they started picking up and now they're back to what they are. So there were several issues why they went down and probably it was related to lockdown. And during the lockdown, the other thing which really, really mattered was the management of risk factors. A lot of our patients stopped BP medicines. They could get access to blood pressure. There was no monitoring. There was no monitoring of diabetes. So when these risk factors burgeoned, then they were landing up to more issues, you know, by and by. So there were a lot of issues which had happened in the initial three months and now we are looking at it. And we also brought out a review of all what has been published in stroke and coronavirus, which got just published in Journal of Stroke just this month. So the implications here are, when we are looking at the manifestations beyond respiratory system, beyond lungs and breathing problems, the issue is their presentations are challenging. Unless you have these antenna up, unless you're aware that COVID can also present with a neurological problem, it can present with a cardiac problem, it can present as something else, as just diarrhea. You won't even look for COVID-19 there. And both clinicians as well as patients may ignore it. And that you know becomes another problem. And then please remember that a lot of them want to ignore also because they get socially isolated. Somebody comes and puts a big you know sticker there that this patient is corona positive and the whole society sort of ostracizes them so there are various reasons why sometimes people tend to ignore they don't want to disclose 
so these are societal concerns you know so they become hidden source of spread of the virus and in a tri age please remember a stroke is a stroke is a stroke a clotted artery needs to be unclogged covid or non covid and we now have algorithms in place so please if there is anybody known to you who's developed a stroke or a heart attack tell them they have to rush to the hospital they should not wait they should not fear because now there is a clarity and i know for in aims at least that we are all dealing with it okay so the missed or erroneous diagnosis is a very important thing because it can lead to disastrous results why they become super spreaders and now you know that if it spreads to the vulnerable it has a 66% you know mortality and please never ever give up on your you know anything pandemic or no pandemic thank you